and speak out. If we can make changes, there is hope. Recalling the horror 35 years later. Tonight, remembering the deadly mass shooting at L'Ecole Polytechnique and the efforts to stop gender-based acts of violence. Good evening. 14 women were killed at an engineering school in 1989 in what became known as the Montreal Massacre. Vigils were held in communities across the country today to remember them, including ceremonies like this one at the University of Toronto. We'll take you there in a moment, but first, CTV Genevieve Beauchemin takes us through what happened that day through the eyes and lens of someone who witnessed the aftermath. It started as what students thought was a Images of that day 35 years ago are etched in the memories of so many across this country. 14 person were killed, all women, and the suspect was found dead. But few saw as much of the horror of that day as Harold Rosenberg did through his lens. So I visited various floors with the detective and uh, we took all the different pictures. He was a photographer with the Montreal police then. He was called in to document the massacre. He says when he got there, it was pandemonium. He spotted a detective. I said to him, uh, you know, what's going on here? And he said, uh, there's 14 people dead. And I said, what are you talking about? And, uh, and that's when it started. He took dozens of photographs of the evidence, even a video, not common practice then. He captured images of the classroom where the gunman separated male and female engineering students. He told us to get out. I don't know what happened with the girls, though. One was Nathalie Provo. She pleaded with the shooter. Well, we are just women who study in engineering. The gunman killed six women in that room and would murder eight others throughout the school before shooting himself. After I finished videotaping in the room, they, uh, as I was leaving, they turned him over and, and uh, found this note or these uh, documents that he had on him. And I think that's where they realized that he had some sort of manifesto. He also mentioned that he, um, that feminists have all, always ruined his life. In his 30-year career, Rosenberg witnessed a lot, accidents, murders. You have sort of this, this uh, invisible shield, you know. That shield. But not remembering what he saw that day, most of all the victims, the 14 young women. Well, that's not an option. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Vigils took place across the country. Tonight, CTV Sean Lethong is at a candlelight vigil at U of T. Sean. Well, Nathan, you can see the area behind me. The candlelight vigil has begun, and uh, it was one of a couple today. The other one happening at Women's College Hospital earlier. Fourteen roses, each one carrying the name of a victim, placed together, linked forever by tragedy. 35 years ago, 14 young women were murdered at Ecole Polytechnique for the crime, the offense, of being women. At Women's College Hospital today, a ceremony marking this grim anniversary with political leaders like Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland and Mayor Olivia Chow lighting a candle, bringing to light the reality of violence against women that Chow says she both saw as a child and lived as a young adult. I got to understand that cycle of violence happens unless we speak out on it, unless we break it uh, and and that if we can speak out, if we can make changes, there is hope. And the victims remembered today were not just the 14 from 35 years ago, but over 60 gender-based victims from Ontario this year alone. Today is, is the reminder that women and girls are still not safe in society. Sheila McDonald is the director of the Ontario Network for Sexual Assault and Treatment Centers. She says societal pressures on women are apparent when talking to victims of gender-based violence. Women internalize and say it's my fault. If I hadn't done this, this wouldn't have happened. And that's simply not true. As a way of breaking through self-blame in the cycle of violence, Mayor Chow announced the city will match funds raised for Interval House, an organization that helps women find safety. This program helps us get women into secure, stable housing, and then get more women into the shelter that need the, the safety. We hope that those that are now stuck in shelter, that they can find a place to live. And they hope that there will be a little light from a dark day. 
Now, the crowd behind me has been growing for some time and is expected to get a little bit bigger. There's going to be many people speaking and performances as well. Many people, of course, carrying candles to bring light, also flowers to remember those victims. Reporting live, I'm Sean Lee Thong. Michelle, send it back to you. Thank you, Sean. Also tonight, more fallout from the Canada Post strike. Large couriers picking up the slack, push pause on some shipments. The latest hit to online orders and what's happening with talks. But first, the investigation continues tonight into a brazen act of gun violence in Brampton. Two men shot in a driveway. One did not survive the deadly incident, all captured on camera. CTV's John Musselman continues to follow developments in this story. He joins us live from Odeon Street near Goreway Drive and Mayfield Road with the latest. John. Well, Michelle, uh, police have cleared the house and the driveway. They did remove a key piece of uh, evidence today from the driveway, and the search for the gunman continues. A Honda Civic with at least three bullet holes was removed from the driveway of this Brampton home to undergo further forensic testing by Peel Regional Police. It was here late Wednesday night when a man was shot and killed and a second man was seriously injured. In this security video, a white car pulls up in front of the house. We are not showing the entire video, but we can tell you the gunman jumps out of the back seat and opens fire. The victim died on the driveway. At least 12 shots ring out. A second man is able to run back into the house. Investigators are calling this a targeted shooting, but the motive is unknown. Neighbors and a real estate agent tell CTV News the people who live at 7 Odeon moved in about a month ago. They are renting the home. They had no other information about the victim or any of the people who live there. Peel police have not released the name of the man who was murdered. There was no update today. This neighbor did not want to appear on camera. A lot of people are concerned, worried, uh, surprised it happened. Police do confirm a separate shooting on the same night in Caledon is linked to the shooting in Brampton, but no other details were released. Police are looking for a white four-door sedan, which matches the car seen in the security video. Now, the police investigation at the home may be over, but as we heard from some neighbors today, there is still a lot of anxiety here about what happened and who was responsible. Reporting live in Brampton, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. Thank you, John. One person was killed today in a two-vehicle crash in Etobicoke. This happened around 11.45 this morning at Atomic Avenue and North Queen Street. A man was taken to hospital in life-threatening condition where he was later pronounced dead. Two others were hurt but are expected to be okay. In a dramatic scene on the Gardner this morning, a truck explosion was caught on camera in the eastbound lanes near the South Kingsway. It happened shortly after 10.30. Fire crews arrived minutes later and were able to put out the flames. We're told the driver of the truck was able to get out safely and no injuries were reported. The OPP are investigating another case of a rock being thrown at a moving vehicle in Markham. The latest in a series of similar incidents on Highway 48 since September. In this instance, a GO bus had its windshield smashed on the night of November 30th while driving on the highway near Major McKenzie, marking at least the 21st similar incident since September. No injuries were reported in this incident. Still ahead, Canada aims to bolster its presence in the Arctic, unveiling new foreign policy that will include an Arctic ambassador and new consulates. And it's been feeling a tad Arctic-like out there as the temperatures hovered below the freezing mark all day today. A live shot out there on this Friday night. You'll want to dress for the cold and the wind chill if you do have plans. Let's bring up the satellite radar and you will see there some bands, the potential for flurries this evening. Uh, but to the north and to the west, look at Perry Sound, Barrie, Owen Sound. There's a snow squall warning. Travel advisory for Kitchener and Goderich. Keep that in mind if you're heading that way. The wind chills the, is what's causing the real cold. It feels like minus nine in Hamilton and Niagara Falls. Here in Toronto, quite similar. If you're looking at the islands, feeling like minus nine, a little bit colder with minus 11 with that wind chill at Pearson. And that really will be what you'll feel if you head out tonight. There's snow in the forecast this weekend and there is rain. We'll get you caught up a little later in the newscast. And the snow is providing the perfect backdrop as our Toy Mountain Tour continues. Tonight, CTV's Beth McDonnell joins us from the Toronto Premium Outlets in Halton Hills. Hey, Beth. 
Hi, Nathan. Hi, Michelle. It's crisp, it's cold, and it's a very special night for Toy Mountain. I'm at Toronto Premium Outlets in Halton Hills, and I'm going to tell you off the bat, we have some big surprises. First up, take a look. There's a massive advent calendar behind me. We know there are the days of December, but we are very excited about today, which is December 6. What is behind this wrapping paper? We don't know. But we have some amazing people already here for us with some beautiful toys. I can't wait to find out who ends up getting these toys and enjoying them over the holidays. And we also have some very special singers with us tonight from Mary Ward Catholic Secondary School in Scarborough. Thank you so much for being here. What are some of the songs you have for us tonight? Tonight we'll be singing Last Christmas and Walking in Winter Wonderland and Santa Baby. And it's all to build a toy yeah. Thank you, Beth. We'll check in a little bit later. <laughs> We've got more tonight on a provincial plan to crack down on homeless encampments. The Premier has legislation in the works to remove them in communities across Ontario. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris has more from mayors who've been calling for action. With legislation coming next week to help municipalities address homelessness and encampments, mayors are feeling encouraged. Nobody should have to live on the street in any community, in any park, anywhere. And the best way to do that is to provide the supports that people need through uh, mental health treatment, through recovery and addictions treatment, and of course, supportive housing. The government has promised money for shelters, but with so many of those living on the streets struggling with mental health and addiction. We need to make sure that the wraparound operating dollars are also attached to some of the housing and units that could be available for people. We expect the bill to include new powers for police to crack down on public drug use and people who repeatedly return to set up tents outside. Using force is not something myself as the mayor or any mayor really wants anything to ever come to. We want people uh, to be housed. We want them to be in shelter. So Mayor Guthrie hopes the bill strikes the right balance. Trying to maintain some public order and at the same time having compassion, empathy, the Premier had challenged mayors to ask him to use the notwithstanding clause to clear encampments. Only a fraction of municipal leaders across the province did. Doug Ford says he'll reach for the charter override if he needs to, but doesn't think it's necessary right now. Some sort of work around around our case. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, and it may still not be charter compliant legislation. That case is out of Kitchener last year, a precedent-setting decision that determined a municipality can't clear an encampment unless there's somewhere indoors for people to go. The worry with any workaround or override of the charter. All you'll see is these, these tent cities being maybe removed from one part of the community and popping up in another part of the community. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Canada's unemployment rate was higher than expected in November. Stats Canada says 51,000 jobs were added across the country last month. That increase was accompanied by more people entering the workforce, prompting unemployment to rise to 6.8 percent. That's the highest it's been in nearly eight years, excluding the pandemic. The report is the last major piece of economic data to be released before the Bank of Canada makes its interest rate announcement next week. The Canada Post strike is now in its fourth week, prompting businesses to turn elsewhere for their shipping needs. But as CTV's Allison Bamford reports, some of those alternative providers are now dealing with a pre-holiday backlog. Another hit to online orders that makes you wonder if you'll ever get those deliveries in time for Christmas. Purolator and UPS, two companies that small businesses have turned to as a solution to the strike, pressed pause on shipments from some third-party courier companies, an effort to clear the backlog of deliveries while still prioritizing critical shipments. One business we spoke to is worried about consumer trust. They say if customers can't depend on small businesses to deliver, they may just switch to Amazon for all of their online orders. And Amazon has put such a high bar on on you know free shipping and 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 overnight like it, it's so easy and we have to be up to that bar we have to be able to offer those same type of services 
Purolator says it will make all attempts to remove service disruptions as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Canada Post is reviewing a counter proposal from the union. After federal mediation stalled last week, both sides deemed to be too far apart. There is no common ground between the two parties because this is a fight over literally the existential future of the post office. A future that's already on the decline when it comes to mail delivery and experts say the strike will likely accelerate it. Now that small businesses have found other couriers, they're not likely to go back, which could force the Crown Corporation to come up with a new business model. Alison Bamford, CTV News, Saskatoon. The federal Liberals still haven't secured a majority in Parliament for their promised rebate checks for working Canadians. The NDP today forced a debate on expanding that eligibility. The checks. The checks right now that are being proposed will go out to someone earning $149,000 but won't go to a senior. That doesn't make any sense. And so this motion... Jagmeet Singh said many non-working Canadians, like those with disabilities and recent graduates, are also in dire need. The Bloc Québécois have joined the call for expanded eligibility, while the Conservatives have criticized the proposed payments and the GST holiday on some goods starting on December 14th. Right now, the Liberal plan would send $250 to Canadians who worked and made under $150,000 in 2023 at an estimated cost of $4.7 billion. Meanwhile, the federal government unveiled a new foreign policy strategy for Canada's Arctic. CTV Jeremy Charon has the details. A new strategy for Canada to protect the Arctic from future threats and incoming challenges. Canada is an Arctic nation and we are at a critical moment. The Arctic is no longer a low tension region. Canada plans to address major changes in the region and a shifting geopolitical landscape through its new Arctic foreign policy, a diplomatic strategy. Among a list of key initiatives, Canada will appoint an Arctic ambassador and will open new consulates in Anchorage, Alaska and Nook, Greenland. It will protect our interests. It will help us share information. It will help obtain information, intelligence, and ultimately it will uh, help us to be able to be much more aware of what's going on and be able to ultimately react. Chief among Canada's concerns in the region, Russia and its Arctic infrastructures, military capabilities and relationship with China in the region, and climate change, specifically the speed at which the Arctic is warming and the growing access to shipping routes because of it. And while the region's remote location and challenging terrain have kept it protected for many generations, as Melanie has indicated, that reality is rapidly changing. Canada's defence minister points to the need for collective defence and diplomatic efforts to assert Canada's sovereignty in the Arctic and the North. The timing of the policy launch, an indication of pressure coming from the incoming Donald Trump administration in the U.S., which has been clear on the importance of defence spending. It's a good promising step. But I think what the Trump administration is going to be looking for is just not promises, but actually money allocation and execution. Today's announcement provides five years of funding, $34 million up front and $7 million ongoing. But military experts say it isn't nearly enough. Jeremy Sherrill, CTV News, Ottawa. Three climbers, including a Canadian, are now believed to have died on New Zealand's highest mountain after they were reported missing on Monday. We do not believe that the men have survived. We believe they have taken a fall. This is certainly not the news we wanted to share today. Officials say the bodies have not been found, but the search on Mount Cook was called off after an aerial survey found footprints in the snow and items belonging to the group. The American climbers have been identified as two men in their 50s. Authorities have not named the Canadian at the request of his family. Excitement is growing in France ahead of this weekend's long-awaited reopening of the Notre Dame Cathedral. It's wonderful that we've got blue skies in Paris to celebrate the opening. Security is tight ahead of tomorrow's ceremony. Dozens of heads of state are expected to be there, along with U.S. President-elect Donald Trump. The cathedral is reopening more than five years after a devastating fire. The scaffolding that surrounded much of the facade has been mostly removed, and a new spire is standing tall. Coming up, a real-life romance on the Nutcracker stage. The heartwarming story of a pair of leads who share a love of ballet and each other.
And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert with holiday shopping underway. Many of us are having packages shipped to our door and there's concern about porch pirates. A new survey finds one out of 10 Canadians had a package stolen last year. We have ways to protect yourself. That story is just ahead. Flurry is possible on this Friday night, mostly cloudy right now, but it's feeling like minus 10 with the wind chill for all those skaters. And if this is the weekend to get your tree bundle up, going to feel that cold tomorrow morning. We warm up a tad by noon, but there is snow expected in the afternoon. Just how much? Just ahead. I'm Beth McDonnell, live at Toronto Premium Outlets in Halton Hills, and I'm joined now by the mayor of Halton Hills, Ann Lawler. Thank you so much for being here. You brought a toy. I did. I found my very favorite polar bear again at uh, a great toy store in our town, and I was able to bring it back, and I'm going to add this to the toy mountain. So many donations, so many toys. What does it mean to see your community give back like this? Well, you know, Halton Hills is a small town, but we've got really big hearts. And um, it, is, it is no surprise to me that this mountain is growing and growing and growing. This is a time when people want to give, they want to share their joy, they want to share their shopping. And uh, so I'm really pleased. It's very true to our community. What's it like out there right now? I know the cost of living has spiked so much. What is the need like right now? Well, you know, the need is really significant. We know that food bank use is increasing. We know we're seeing on, on the news that inflation is going up. There are a lot of people who are really, really feeling the pinch right now. So to be able to give, to be able to share, as Salvation Army gives us that opportunity to do that. All I... the more reason to build a toy mountain. Thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you. The holiday season is the busiest time of the year for couriers, and that's especially true this year with the postal strike. Many of us are online shopping and having packages delivered to our door, and the fear of having them stolen is a major concern. Here's Pat Forn and Consumer Alert. Pat. Thanks, Nathan. And Michelle, a new survey finds one out of 10 Canadians had at least one package stolen in the past year, but the company says that's 6% lower than the year before. They say new tracking systems and consumer awareness is leading to a decrease in thefts. With many homeowners now having video doorbells and security systems, there's lots of evidence of package thefts. Adam Ryder of Montreal had his packages stolen from his doorstep recently, but when a neighbor called police, he actually got them back. Just wanted to let you know some good news that we found the people, we've arrested them, and we have your stuff. And I was like, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Being reunited with stolen packages is rare. A holiday package theft survey from FedEx found that 67% of shoppers are worried about package theft. 19% of shoppers experience package theft in their lifetime, 10% in the past year. FedEx says porch piracy is actually declining as couriers work to prevent it, like delivery drivers making sure they're not being followed. We do monitor that. We have... A lot of measures on the security side that I'm not at liberty to say because we don't want to tip off the porch pirates. To prevent package theft, use package tracking, send parcels to a work address, or redirect to a friend, family member, or courier location. Use photo proof delivery confirmation and give couriers delivery instructions. FedEx says with its app, you can communicate directly with the driver if you have a special request. You can even tell the driver where to hide the package for you on your property or across the street at a neighbor's. And we want to follow those instructions so that we can stem this tide. In the event you have a package stolen, you should file a police report and work with the online retailer and the courier to get a refund. Amazon recently introduced a service to prevent porch piracy. With Amazon Key and your permission, drivers can open your garage door, drop off the package and close it again. More homeowners are also installing delivery boxes, which can be secured to your home, keeping your packages safe until you arrive. And porch piracy is also a major problem in the U.S. And now there's a company offering package theft insurance. The company is called Porch Pals. For $120 a year, you're insured for up to $2,000 worth of deliveries or three claims a year. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at 
alert at ctv.ca. The TTC announced today it will not be resuming streetcar service on Spadina this month as originally scheduled. The track has been closed for repairs and upgrades since June. The transit agency now says crews have encountered unexpected challenges and need extra time to remove and replace hundreds of meters of rail, bolts and anchors. Replacement bus service is now slated to continue through March. Meanwhile, if you're planning to take transit this weekend, there's going to be another major subway closure starting at 11 o'clock tonight. Line 1 trains will once again not be running between St. Clair West and King Stations because of planned track work. Shuttle buses, surface routes, and the other side of Line 1 will be running. And for GO Transit riders, trains on the Lakeshore West Line will run hourly this weekend between West Harbor GO and Union Station. The disruption is to allow for construction at Exhibition GO. Trains won't run at all on the Stouffville Line, and replacement buses will only serve Union and stops outside the TTC service area. You know, thinking about getting around the commute transit in the city, not so bad, but north of us are getting hit pretty hard with the snow squalls and the watches. Lots of uh, concerns if you're heading up north. Definitely. If you have any plans to go up north, you want to be aware of the forecast. It's not an ideal drive, although I will. we do have a story a little bit later. Skiing's been pretty good. They're going to be starting early this season. Here's a live look at our skyline. Just cloudy conditions right now. If we pull up the radar, you'll see there is the chance for some flurries, uh, depending on where you are, but uh, nothing that will really get in your way. I think the issue tonight, if you do have plans to go out, is the temperature. Minus 3 right now in Toronto, but it feels like minus. 10. So you want to bundle up or you're going to suffer. The lows tonight, much the same. The wind chill really is the factor out there. Tomorrow's highs, yes, we get into positive territory with a high of one in Toronto, but we still have the wind chill. So it is a December weekend, definitely. So Here's another um, thing we want to point out for this weekend, and that's tomorrow. There is snow on tap. So if we bring the forecast radar forward, this is tonight, uh, just the potential 40% of flurries. And then into tomorrow, we stop it here at noon. That's when we could see the snow start. And if we move it forward into the early evening, that is the bulk of the snow that we're expecting, about 2 to 4 centimeters possible. Nothing overwhelming but certainly when you have snow falling and you have wind it can impact your drive so keep that in mind and then it pushes out by Saturday night and with Sunday the start of your day we're really just dealing with cloudy conditions so here's how your seven day forecast breaks down we have that snow on tap for tomorrow a high of one degree cool day Sunday you'll notice the warm-up that's where we go from the potential for slow to showers Monday depending on what temperature it is when we get precipitation there's a chance for rain or snow about a 60% chance. Tuesday brings showers and we stay warm. Wednesday, it cools down a bit. There's the potential for flurries. And then Thursday, Friday, look, we could see the sun again, but we're, you know, cooling down a tad. That's your forecast. We'll have more just ahead. But guess what? We're at the end of week three of our Toy Mountain campaign already. Already. Tonight, CTV's Beth McDonnell is at Toronto's premium outlets in Halton Hills. Hey, Beth. Hey, and two weeks to go, so we got to build that mountain. I'm with Erin from Salvation yes, Army making hello. this all possible. Thank Amazing. you so much. Thank you. The big surprise, advent calendar. Break yes. it down. What's happening? Yeah, so Toronto Premium Outlets has this advent calendar where they're doing 12 days of deals. They're revealing, uh, you know, different gift inspiration each day, and they've graciously given us box number six. Should we, we get a drum roll? We should get a drum roll going. Woo! Let's see what's behind number six. Oh, here we go. Oh, yay, one more, big rip, big rip. So people are able to actually scan the QR code that's a part of the box. They'll see a Salvation Army scene and they can give online by scanning the code. Amazing, amazing. The yes. more ways to give, the better. All right, Chrissy Good, thank you for being here from Kate Spade. Most amazing train I've ever seen. I can't believe it. I love the colors, but I love even more what's inside. What's inside this huge train? Well, in keeping with the season of giving and our wish to spread joy, the teams at Kate Spade pulled together and we are pleased to announce that we are donating 367 toys to this year's Toy Mountain. <laughs> It, it looks fantastic. If I was anywhere between 2 and 15, I'm sure I could just dive right in there and find something I would love. How did this come to be? How did you come to give so much? It, the Christmas holiday should be magical. And if there's anything that we could do 
to continue that magic for the children in our community, it was, it was an easy gift, like it, easy for us to do. How did it come together? How did you motivate everybody? I honestly have the best team of people and two of them are trying to hide behind you right now. Um, they just, they want to do this. It's, it's an easy ask of my team, honestly. They're fantastic. The spirit of giving is such a beautiful thing. We're so lucky to have people in our community like you and like the people behind Toy Mountain here. We have our beautiful singers. I think it's time we hand it over to them. The Christmas tree at the Christmas party. Okay. All right. Now, of course, we love getting all your pictures related to Toy Mountain. You just have to email toy.mountain at bellmedia.ca. Every Tuesday we show them, and it's just so great seeing our community give back. Easy to do. They sound great, don't they? Oh, they do. And I hate to do this, from the sweet sounds of the holiday to some pretty awful sounds. Whooping cough cases on the rise across the country. The concerning spike here in Toronto and expert insight into how to avoid catching it. Whooping cough cases are on the rise across the country. And there are concerns there's been a spike in Ontario. CTV's Heather Wright has the story. Whooping cough, pertussis, the 100-day cough. It's an infection that can cause people to cough so hard they break a rib. And it's on the rise across Canada. The most common group that is getting it are people that are under-vaccinated or unvaccinated, and also adults that have waning immunity. Ontario has recorded the highest number of whooping cough cases since 2007. So far this year, there have been more than 1,400 reported cases, four times as many that were seen last year. Cases are also on the rise across the country. 19,000 cases have been reported, a sharp increase from a typical year of between 1,000 and 3,000. Experts are urging parents to make sure their children's vaccinations are up to date. I think we can attribute a lot of this to the fact that we've seen flagging vaccination rates. Uh, a lot of it due to the pandemic, uh, some of it due to the anti-vaccine sentiment and vaccine fatigue. Whooping cough is a highly contagious disease that can affect anyone, but is most common in children, teenagers, and young babies. Symptoms include severe coughing, fatigue, and difficulty breathing. Babies that are too young to be inoculated are particularly susceptible. So they actually might not cough. They might actually just have a pause in their breathing. Um, and that's why it is so severe for them and why we need to make sure that they're protected. Of the 58 people hospitalized in Ontario, half were under the age of one. Four babies had to be treated in the ICU. Whooping cough is cyclical, and doctors say this rise in cases is within the typical pattern of the disease, though they note these numbers are much higher than what's usually seen. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is expanding recalls of imported cucumbers potentially contaminated by salmonella. Last month, officials announced Sunfed brand cucumbers were being taken off the shelves in several provinces, including Ontario. They now say some of that produce may have been sold loose or in bulk without brand labels. A salmonella-related recall was also issued for Pamela brand cucumbers, mostly sold in B.C. and Alberta. So far, no cases of illnesses have been reported in Canada. Cole plays out with a new music video with a star guest familiar to several generations of fans. You got all my love. Almost on key. Yeah, I'll go up the octave. And that is screen legend Dick Van Dyke singing and dancing to Coldplay's track All My Love at his Malibu home. The seven-minute video also features appearances from Van Dyke's family and an interview where he reflects on his life of playing and acting silly. Dick Van Dyke turns 99 one week from today. Taylor Swift begins the last leg of her era's tour in Vancouver tonight. Swift has three shows there to end the massive tour, which began nearly two years ago. The pop star has played more than 150 shows across five continents since it began, which included those six shows here in Toronto last month. 
and a major tourist attraction in Vancouver is showing its swifty pride. The 137 meter long Capilano suspension bridge is sporting its very own friendship bracelet. How fitting. About 160,000 fans are due to attend Swift's final three shows in Vancouver. Dolly Parton's put out a casting call for a theatrical production telling her life story. I want to give you the chance to help me bring my story to Broadway and maybe even play me. This shows the country legend said the music or the search is on for someone to take on the title role when Dolly, an original musical, debuts. She said her team is looking for anyone able to take on the task, whether they're experienced theater professionals or just starting out. While initial tryouts are online, Parton said a select few will get in-person auditions when the show's, with the show's casting director. A real-life fairy tale love story takes the stage as the National Ballet's Nutcracker returns for the holidays. As CTV's Pauline Chan tells us, one of the lead couples just got married this year, and this will be their first time starring together. Cotisato noticed Brenna Flaherty when she first joined the company, but then the pandemic happened, and it was difficult because Brenna spent time with her family in the U.S., while Cota went back to his in Japan. But true love prevails, and they were married in Japan last January. The wedding planning process was a bit difficult just because we were across the world and we had, you know, to translate everything. It was amazing, and it's so, it was so nice to see everyone I loved, Brenna's family and everyone was gathered in the same room and we celebrated together and it was, it was just so special. While they have danced on stage together before, this season's Nutcracker will be the first time they're both playing the leads. And for Brenna, it will be her debut as the Sugar Plum Fairy. I think Nutcracker for me, and I think a lot of other dancers would say this, is that it sort of is like a benchmark of someone's career. So everyone does Nutcracker in the company and Usually kids do it from the school as well, so you sort of rise up through the ranks. Kota plays Peter, the stable boy who transforms into the Nutcracker Prince. He's the good older brother figure for Misha and Marie, and we're great friends. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna fall asleep at the night after the party, and they're gonna have a crazy dream <laughs> to go to the battle of all the animals and beautiful snow scenes. Is it difficult for the married couple to also work together? I think it's um, easier to dance together because I know how she functions and I know how, like we can communicate so well mm -hmm. in studio or at home, mm -hmm. which helps a lot. It's a holiday classic that both have worked hard to achieve. And we hope everyone has a happy and healthy holiday season with your family, friends, and loved ones. Coda and Brenna have their first performance together on December 14th, and the National Ballet's production of Nutcracker runs December 6th to the 31st. Pauline Chan, CTV News. After the break, the hefty dose of snow to the north ushers in ski season. The hills are alive with activity as resorts work to open nice and early. Brush off the gear will give you the lay of the land just ahead. Today is, is the reminder that women and girls are still not safe in society. Updating our top stories here in Toronto and across the country, Canadians gathered to mark 35 years since the École Polytechnique massacre in Montreal. A gunman who expressed hatred for feminists killed 14 women that day. Advocates say more work must be done to prevent gender-based violence to the public uh, for their tips and their assistance in bringing this person to uh, account. Provincial police are investigating after a rock was thrown at a GO bus in Markham. This happened the night of November 30th while the bus was driving on Highway 48 near Major McKenzie, marking at least the 21st time this has happened since September. Nobody was injured in this last case, but an earlier one caused a crash that left two people critically injured. In this changing environment has created new threats and vulnerabilities, which do necessitate a res an urgent response. 
And as the Arctic warms and becomes the focus of more potential international tension, the federal government is outlining a new diplomatic and military strategy for the North. Defense analysts say the initial funding outlined by Ottawa for the region is likely not nearly enough. Remember to keep up to date day and night at ctvnewstoronto.ca and by downloading the CTV News app. On the markets, the Canadian dollar traded at 70.66 U.S. cents, down almost a cent. Western Canadian Select Oil down 63 cents to close at 55.27 a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index ended at 25,691.80, up just under 12 points. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. All the snow that fell up north this week has been excellent news for ski resorts. And some were able to open today. CTV's Mike Lang has the story. The busy week of snow has been an early holiday gift for skiers in central Ontario. What are the trails like today? Really, really nice compared to last year. We actually have snow other than grass. The slopes are well groomed. It's fast. It's good. What a great day. Thousands making the trip to Mount St. Louis Moonstone on Friday for the resort's 60th season opening day. Uh, where are you guys from? Uh, I'm Markham. We're actually from Toronto. We're from uh, Prairie Sound. Nearby children and teens enjoying a day on the slopes instead of in the classroom. It's a snow day today, so we're missing school. I feel like this is a much better learning environment than a classroom. Mount St. Louis opened on Friday with 15 slopes, four chairlifts and a snow base of up to 55 centimeters. Probably our strongest start we've ever had in the history of Mount St. Louis. Christmas represents 30 percent of the, the season uh, and so if we can get a good strong Christmas it, it, it sets the season up. At Horseshoe Valley, another 100-plus braving near whiteout conditions to get their first taste of the slopes this season. You can see around 20 meters ahead of you. You're always kind of wiping your goggles, but if you like the sport, then it, you don't really mind. And after losing both the holiday season and March break to rain last year. We haven't seen a year like that in over 25 years that I've been in the industry. The resort's general manager excited to get up to three lifts and 11 runs open over the weekend. It's so important this time of year to get a great start. Now people know that they can make their plans for the holidays to, to commit, book their rooms, book their stays and, uh, and commit to going away on a ski and snowboard vacation. As for the other major ski resorts in the region, Blue Mountain is set to open on Saturday with at least two two lifts in operation, while Snow Valley staff say they hope to be open for skiing and snowboarding by next weekend. Mike Lang, CTV News, or Medante. From the hills to the ice, the Leafs will go for a fourth straight win tonight as they host the Washington Capitals. Toronto is coming off a comeback 3-2 win against Nashville Wednesday night that saw Austin Matthews score twice. The team has won 10 of their last 12 games with their goalie tandem of Joseph Wall and Anthony Stolarz putting up some stellar numbers. Puck drop tonight at Scotiabank Arena is set for just after 7. 3 of 7 here in the quarter. And the Raptors hosted the Oklahoma City Thunder last night, but they were no match for their Canadian rival. Toronto-born Shea Gilgis-Alexander led the Thunder with 30 points. The Raptors were coming off back-to-back -back wins, but trailed by 25 at the half and lost the game 129-92. to The Raptors play host to the Dallas Mavericks tomorrow night. Giving just makes you feel so good, doesn't it? I want to give a special shout out to Fossil Group. They have two stores here at Toronto Premium Outlets in Halton Hills. Some amazing toys, Lego, Barbie, Care Bears, Stuffies, so many wonderful toys. I know as a kid, I would be so happy to unwrap. And as you know, it's a chilly night here in Halton Hills. We're trying to stay warm. We have Scout here who is helping us with the moves on how to stay warm. We are breaking it down a little bit, moving the feet, moving the hips, and uh, you know, a little movement never hurts when it's a chilly night. Our Toy Mountain is sure taking shape. And it's getting a big boost in Halton Hills tonight, even in this chilly weather. Mm -hmm. Let's check in one more time with Beth McTanel, live at Toronto Premium Outlets. It's been a great hour, Beth. It's been so fun, and the giving continues. I'm with Jeff and Acom from Movado. Thank you for being here. Of course. Thank you for having us. What did you bring? What does it mean to give? Yeah, so our beautiful team collected over 100 toys to just spread some cheer and love throughout the community and, you know, add to the toy mountain going on today. 
Yeah, Toy Mountain. Erin, so many kids are going to be getting toys because of this amazing effort, yes. but the need is great. Where are we at? Break it down. Yeah, the need is so great. We have so far collected over 16,000 toys. Amazing, but we have only two weeks left, and we're aiming to support over 70,000 children across the GTA. So there's still so much that we need, and we're hoping that people can come out, donate a new unwrapped toy, and help us bring smiles to children's faces. All right, and if you're coming to Toronto, premium outlets you want people to stop by the advent calendar and scan the QR code because you scan this it links you to all the information you need to, to donate to Toy Mountain which means giving which means good which means smile so we're so, so wonderful thank you to everyone who's helped me make it through this wonderful evening tonight all right we're gonna we're CTV Salvation Army and all of you we're gonna build a toy mountain yeah Lots of fun. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Fa fabulous. Appreciate all the donations there. And you notice they're bundled up. They have to be tonight because let's look at the radar. You'll see that we have the potential for flurries, but the temperatures this evening are uh, really frigid. And actually to the north, there are some warnings and travel advisories. So if you are driving up there, keep that in mind. But yes, in Toronto right now, it's minus three feeling like minus 10. So luckily there was all that generosity and warmth for Beth and the team there at Toy Mountain. Uh, tomorrow, keep in mind, snow we're expecting in the starting in the afternoon and early evening, two to four centimeters possible. The high only one degree. Sunday, we warm up and then we have the potential for showers with a high of five degrees. And it stays unsettled next week, but it will cool down by the end of, end of the week. So this is going to be a week that you want to watch the weather forecast because it changes a little bit each day. Good That's enough. it. Yep, that's it for us. Sorry to interrupt there, Nathan. Uh, you can join Heather Butts at 11 tonight for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with your next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and at ctvnewstoronto.com. For all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a wonderful night and a fabulous weekend. Right, let's check back in with our friends building a toy mountain.